Okay, so we all know the busiest shopping day of the year, don't we? Foot traffic wise, what's the busiest shopping day of the year? Black Friday. Perhaps not the most sold, but the most people out. You know, we hear about that. Anyone care to guess what the second most popular shopping day of the year is by traffic? Tuesday. Tuesday? <laughs> Just any random Tuesday, huh? Well, it's a better guess than anybody else took, so we're thankful for that. Anyone? The day after Christmas, it's it. You know, you know, it's not as though people are out buying. What are they out doing? They're returning. They're taking things back. Because every year at Christmas, doesn't it happen? We get things we don't want, we, 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 we have no use for. Like even as we're opening it and we're, we're ooing and aahing over it in front of the person who gave it to us, we're thinking, man, I'm taking that back tomorrow. <laughs> going to give me something I want. Don't we? <laughs> I read that in 2014... 284 billion, that's billion with a B as in boy, $284 billion worth of merchandise is returned after Christmas in the United States. That's insane, the amount of stuff we return. We return our gifts. Certainly, we, we return gifts we don't need. Like, you, someone gets you a shirt that's too small. You have no need for that. So you return it, or, or you get a coffee maker. I already have a coffee maker. This is the same coffee maker I already have. So you return it. it, it you don't want it because it's unnecessary. It's pointless. Sometimes, though, we return gifts that we really do need. We just don't want them. We don't want to admit that we need it, so we don't want it, right? Case about ladies, did you ever have your husband or a guy buy a shirt that's a size up from the size that you usually wear, and after you get done trying to strangle him with it, you just kind of passive-aggressively say, it's all right, you fold up a purse, I'll just, I'll just return it, Right? Now, let's be honest, sometimes, maybe not always, but sometimes, maybe you've put on a few pounds and that shirt will look nicer on you than the size you wear. So you don't want that bigger shirt, but you need them. It's like me this year, I kind of had to go buy bigger jeans. I didn't want bigger jeans, but I needed them. Or your friend might buy you this book about how to handle stress in your life and you open it and you're like, oh, wonderful. And you're thinking, what is wrong with this person? I can handle the stress on my own. I don't need this book. And so you, you take it back, you return it, even though you might not necessarily need it. You, you see, uh, it's not unusual for us to want to return gifts, and perhaps even when we need them. It's just what we do. Something very similar happens all the time with people in the church of Jesus Christ. You know, we, we read in the passage today from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul tells us God gives us gifts. We call them spiritual gifts. He gives them to us, and the problem is that, that many within the church act like they don't want these gifts. Well, we think we don't need them. And so we're like, here, God, take it back. I, I don't want it. We, we try to return it like we do gifts at Christmas time. Let me explain what I mean by looking at one of the verses out of today's passage. Uh, do you want to show us there, Jim? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, where it says, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. It's a relatively short verse, but there's a lot in there that I want to point out to you today. First of all, it says something is given. That's the definition of a gift, right? If you give something, that's a gift. You, know, you can kind of hear even in the words of the same. So there is a gift, and, and it's given by, by, by God. So God gives a gift. You know what this means? God gives a gift. God picks what the gift is. He picks what he gives you. You don't pick your own gift from God. That's not how it works. Like when you buy gifts for somebody else, you pick it, and you give it to them, right? Now, some of you are good at picking gifts for others, and some of you might be like me, and you're bad. I think I told you before about the time I got my older sister for Christmas a shirt. And she took it back. She returned it. And while she was there, she had a conversation with the sales clerk and everyone else around about how awful that shirt was. And then she came back and made sure I knew about that conversation. Right? So you pick gifts. Sometimes you're good at it. Sometimes you're bad. But God picks the gift, and he gives you. You don't pick your own gift. Right? No, God does. So, God gives you a gift, and what does he give you? Oh, it says right here, the, the manifestation of the Spirit. Pfft, okay then, sermon done. No, what the heck does that mean? You know, we can get you know, a manifestation of the Spirit, I don't even know. We can get confused by that. And it's important for us to understand this. You know, in Paul's day, even in Paul's day, they were confused by this. 
And they were confused by this idea of manifestation of the Spirit, what we call spiritual gifts. You know, and that's the reason Paul's writing. You know, Paul actually writes 1 Corinthians, and in chapter 12, as I read to you today, he opens it up to, he says, about spiritual gifts. I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be uneducated. I don't want you to not know what they are. I don't want you to be confused. Because Paul is writing to the Corinthians because the Corinthians, they were confused. They assumed, they saw certain gifts, particular manifestations of the Spirit, particularly that of speaking in tongues, speaking other languages. They saw that as better. That, that meant you were super spiritual. You, you had the gift of tongues. You're good. Now, if you didn't have the gift of speaking in tongues, maybe you weren't as spiritual. Maybe you weren't as good. Maybe, maybe, maybe you weren't a really good follower of Jesus if you don't have this gift. So Paul writes to him. He says, no, let me explain to you about these spiritual gifts. So spiritual gifts, manifestation of the spirit. What are spiritual gifts? They are abilities by which we receive the grace of God and by which God enables us to disperse that grace to others. Okay, try again, Pastor. A lot of big words there. A lot, a lot of long words there. Spiritual gifts. Working of the Holy Spirit in and through you. So, a spiritual gifts, the Holy Spirit empowers you to spread God's grace and love and to experience God's grace and love with others through specific means that are different to each believer. So the Holy Spirit empowers you to do His work, to spread His grace. And how the Holy Spirit empowers you is your gift, and it's different. So Dixie, you've got spiritual gifts, and they're different from Dottie, and it's different than Bob. Same Spirit giving them, same God. But you got them, and they're all different. And you know, and you're like, well, what do we mean by this, Pastor? Well, as an example, Paul gives some in today's scripture passage. He says some spiritual gifts, apostleship or leadership in the early church. You, you, you are enabled by the Holy Spirit to spread God's grace by leading, or, or teaching, or healing, or working miracles, or, or interpreting for other people. Spiritual gifts, you know, Paul mentions them there. Now, there are other places in Scripture where we get lists uh, of spiritual gifts. And some of them include hospitality. You are enabled by the Holy Spirit to be hospitable to people when other people kind of struggle with that. Uh, you might be having the spiritual gift of correcting or admonishing or rebuking or, or of serving. Now, we're all called to serve, but the Holy Spirit empowers some people to do it much more naturally and fluidly than other people. These lists we get of spiritual gifts in, in the scriptures, now they're not exhaustive. They serve as examples for us. We're trying to figure out what are spiritual gifts. You might have heard some of the things I said, and you might be thinking, yeah, I think I might have some of those spiritual gifts. You might have spiritual gifts that I didn't talk about at all there in that list. Might not even be mentioned in Scripture, but you got them. Your spiritual gifts are however you are specifically enabled through God's Holy Spirit to spread and share His grace with others. That's what it is. Now, look, it's the manifestation of the Spirit. And, and Paul says, it's given to each one. So pay attention here, because this is you. You are one of the each ones. God gives spiritual gifts. He manifests His Spirit in the life of every believer in Jesus Christ. There can be no Eeyores here. You guys know who Eeyore is? That, that donkey from Winnie the Pooh stories? Woe is me. Nothing special here. It's just me. No, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you are looking to Him for the forgiveness of sins, trusting Him for that gift of eternal life with God, then you can't be Eeyore because you're gifted. You can't be there. Oh, woe is me. I don't have any spiritual gifts in the church like all those other people. It's just me. You can't be Eeyore because you are special. God has manifested his spirit in each one. God has made you special by manifesting his spirit in you. See, the Corinthians thought that only people with the gift of speaking in tongues, they were the only ones who were special. Paul tells them, no, he tells us, everyone's special because everyone receives spiritual gifts. Everyone receives the manifestation of the spirit in their lives. Now, Paul tells us there are different, there are different gifts. 
But they are given by God. They're all special. And they're all necessary. Necessary for what? That's the final thing I want to point out about this verse. Necessary for the common good. Meaning within context, they are necessary for the common good of the church of Jesus Christ, for the local congregation. Meaning that they are to be used by the individuals who have these gifts in order to build up and to support the other people in the church. That's why you're given them. Meaning, guess what? Spiritual gifts, they're not about the self. God gives you spiritual gift, and who's it really for? It's for other people. You're gifted for other people. And this, I think, is why people in the church are so often kind of returning their spiritual gifts to God. They, they kind of want to give them back. Because it's not about the self. Because by nature, we human beings, we are selfish. We are self-focused, aren't we? God manifests His Spirit in us. He gives us a spiritual gift. And we just kind of throw it back at Him. Because, well, God, this isn't really what I want from you. God, let me tell you what I want from you. I want things about me from you. I want things that are for my comfort. I want things that are... For for my joy, things that are uh, uh, fulfill my desires, things that, that will help me work things out the way I, I think they should be worked out, God. That's what I want from you. This, this, this stuff you're giving me to help and serve other people, not so much. See, we ignore our spiritual gifts. We throw them back. Because we're not focused on the common good of the church. Now, now, sometimes, some of us do focus on the common good of the church. But so often, most of us get distracted by, from that very easily. Because we get self-focused. We put our focus elsewhere. Like, right? And I got career advancement to attend to. I got parties to attend. I got people to impress. I got to go places so I can be impressed by other people. I got restaurants to eat in. I have TV shows to binge watch. I've got a bed to sleep in. I've got football games to take in. I got a house to make pretty. I got toys to play with. I got concerns and business that I need to go worry about even though I can't do anything about it. You see, we focus on these things. These are all things about us. And that's where our focus is. Not in the common good of the church. And so our spiritual gifts, they're left to languish. It's like being given a gift and returning it. We th think we don't need this gift because we don't want it. Do we recognize the opportunities for self-fulfillment, the opportunities for the growth of the kingdom of God? We are just throwing away when we ignore our spiritual gifts. Let me tell you what I mean by taking you to the book of Exodus. Now, some of you who've read the book of Exodus are thinking, oh, no, not the book of Exodus. What is he going to give us from that? Because you know in the book of Exodus, no fewer than 10 chapters are taken by God explaining in very specific detail about how to build the tabernacle, this tent where God says, I'll meet with you. How to build that and everything that is associated with it. Jim, show us a picture here. God says, I want you to build all these things. I want you to build this tent here. That's the actual tabernacle itself out of fine, fine uh, material. Now, that fine material, guess what? You're going to have to hand weave it all yourself. And all these curtains that make this wall around the tabernacle, all the, all the fabric for that has to be hand woven as well out of fine materials. The, the work of an embroiderer. You have to do that. And then there are these, you see this priest down there, these, uh, these weird garments he's wearing. Those are prescribed by God. He says, you have to get the right materials. Again, hand weave all these materials, this fine linen, and then sew this, this outfit together and incorporate it in your sewing all these precious gems in the right way that God has prescribed. And all these other different accoutrements had to be there just right. And then there are all these other uh, utensils and, and the furniture that is used at the tabernacle for the sacrifices that they were to bring before God. God says, you've got to build them all. You've got to build them right. And some of them needed to be molded out of, out of bronze. Some of them were molded out of pure gold. Some of them were fashioned out of wood and then just overlaid in pure gold. God says, you've got to do it and get it right. And the crowning achievement of it all was the Ark of the Covenant, which if you're an Indiana Jones fan, you're very familiar with. I mean, the Ark of the Covenant with, with, with the seraphim over top, with their wings reaching out to form that mercy seat where God said he would rest among his people. It was a fine piece of art, all fashioned out of gold. 
God said, make it all for me and make it good. And make it exactly as I have prescribed for you. And chapter after chapter of specific details. Now God says this to the people of Israel. Who just recently came out of slavery in Egypt. These weren't craftsmen. They, they didn't have standing workshops to do this in. How on earth are they going to get this done? Fear not. God comes, he says in Exodus 31, verses 2 and 3. God says, I have given you Bezalel, son of Uri, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, ability, and knowledge, and all kinds of crafts. Did you catch it? God says, Bezalel, I will manifest my spirit among him to give him the abilities to do this. It's a spiritual gift. And God says, I don't just give you Bezalel. I also give you a holy son of Ahazamach. He, he's going to be gifted to be able to, to do these skillful things too. And God says, not only are they going to be gifted in these skills, but I'm also going to gift them to be able to teach. So they can teach the people, these former slaves, how to do this stuff. How they can do all this fine work, just as I've instructed. And so, uh, Bezalel and Aholiab, they go to work with the people to do it, to get it done. And let me read to you from Exodus chapter 39, starting at verse 32, how it turned out. There's a lot here, right? So, all the work of the tabernacle, uh, uh, the tent of meeting, was completed. The Israelites did everything just as the Lord commanded Moses. Then they brought the tabernacle to Moses. The tent and all its furnishings, its claps, frames, crossbars, posts, bases, the covering of ram skins dyed red, and the covering of another durable leather, and the shield and curtain, the ark of the covenant law with its poles and its atonement cover, the table with all its articles and the bread of the presence, the pure gold lampstand with its rows of lamps and all its accessories, and the olive oil for the light, the gold altar, the anointing oil, the fragrant incense, and the curtain for the entrance to the tent, the bronze altar with its bronze grating, its poles and its utensils, the basin with its stand, the curtains of the courtyard with its posts and bases, and the curtain for the entrance to the courtyard, the ropes and the tent pegs of the courtyard, all the furnishings for the tabernacle, the tent of Meeting, and woven garments worn for ministering in the sanctuary, both sacred garments for Aaron and priest, and garments for the son serving as priest. All that stuff. They get it done. And then continues the Israelites had done all the work just as the Lord commanded Moses. Moses inspected the word and saw that they had done it just as the Lord commanded. So Moses blessed them. Moses stands before the people, representing God to them, and he blesses them. The people receive God's blessing. Why do they receive God's blessing? How on earth were they able to accomplish it all? Exactly as God said. They, they did everything exactly that God wanted them to do. Here's how, when God gifted people, when he gifted Bezalel and Holiab through his Holy Spirit, they didn't ignore their gifts. They didn't try to take them back and say, God, this isn't what I want to do. They answered the, the, the call and they used their gifts for the common good of all God's people. And they did it at the cost of their own comfort, I'm sure, because, hey, they were working with the people of Israel. And if it was one thing we learned by reading about the encounters of Moses leading the people of Israel, is that these people were not easy to work with. They, they, they were, were not. They, they were, were, were selfish whiners. They cared only about themselves about their own comfort, their own agendas, about how they thought things should be working and going. They just cared about themselves. But when God gifted Bezalel and Oholiab, and probably some others among them, they responded. They used their gifts for the common good of the people of God. And they as individuals were blessed in that. Even as the whole people was blessed by God. See, God waits to pour out his blessings on his church like that today. That's why he gives us spiritual gifts for the common good, so that his grace can bless the congregations. He says it's for the common good. If it's for the common good, get this. It's detrimental for you to receive a gift from God and not use it. It's like you get that Christmas gift you need, but you don't want it, so you return it. But you still need it. You know, we've been talking over the past few weeks about this metaphor that Paul sets up in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 about the church. The church of Jesus Christ, it is a body. And just as we have talked about how you don't work without the church because you don't. The church does not work without you because you're part of a body. A body that is designed to have all its parts functioning. It doesn't work without all the parts. We've talked about that. 
So how do spiritual gifts fit in this? Paul's talking about all this in the same chapter of 1 Corinthians. Where do spiritual gifts fit in? Well, spiritual gifts define what part of the body you are. God gifts you to fulfill a specific role. And if you don't know what your gifts are, you don't know what body part you are. You don't know what you're supposed to be doing. You're kind of floundering out there on your own. If you don't know what your spiritual gifts are, if you're not using them, then both you and the church are suffering. That's the point I started out three weeks ago to make from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we finally got to it. This idea, if you don't know what your spiritual gifts are and you're not using them, then you are suffering and the church of Jesus Christ is suffering. Stop the suffering. So what's your spiritual gift? What is it? Do you know? Have you considered it lately? Have, if you do know, I have an idea of what your spiritual gifts are. Have you looked at your life lately and said, hey, am I using this gift to its fullest potential for the kingdom of God? Think about it. The God, the creator of the universe, wants to enable you to receive his spirit. He wants to spread his love and his grace and work it in and through you. How glorious. So how specifically does he want to do that through you? What's your gift? Figure out your spiritual gifts and use them. And then ask God to increase your usefulness. Because if God increases your usefulness, he, he's going to have to let you know in a more vivid way how you are equipped to carry out how he has made you useful. Say, so God, make me more useful. Seek opportunities to serve. Here it is. The best way to figure out what your spiritual gifts are is to serve. Serve in ways you've served before. Look for ways to serve that you haven't necessarily served before and go do it. Try it. See if you make a connection with the Holy Spirit in your life. Look at how other believers are serving and seeing if that seems attractive to you in your walk with God. You can ask those you have served and those who serve alongside you to help you distinguish and determine your spiritual strengths and list other people's help. And then if you think you've got a, a spiritual gift, go use it. Practice. Use it and use it and use it. So you become stronger. You become more confident that this is a gift God has given you. Even as you strengthen yourself in the church. You see, I'm like the Apostle Paul here today. As your pastor... I'm saying to you, I don't want you to be ignorant about spiritual gifts. I want you to know what yours are. I want you to experience them. Because when you experience your spiritual gifts, you are blessed. And that's what I want for you today.